everyone, and thank you for joining me here on Think Tech Hawaii. My name is DeSoto Brown, and I am the host of this series, which is called, How Did We Get Here? And by that, I mean, how did we get to where we are today, looking back in Hawaiian history at things that you may not have known, uh, things that you will enjoy knowing about. And I work as the uh, Bishop Museum historian at Bishop Museum here in Honolulu. I'm also the curator for the archives department. And what I'm going to show you today consists of images that are not only from Bishop Museum archives, but also from my own personal collection. So I'm calling this factoids of Hawaiian history. What is a factoid? Well, a factoid is a made up word that's of recent derivation. And it means something that is factual, but not necessarily all that important, maybe kind of trivia. So I'm gonna be telling you factoids today that may or may not be very important. And you'll see some of them are a great deal more important than others. So to begin with, uh, to begin with, there we go, excuse me. We're gonna talk about some of the things that happened for the first time in Hawaiian history. And to start with, we're looking at the first movie showing in the Hawaiian Islands, which took place on February 5th, 1897. That was a demonstration of something called the Edison Veriscope, meaning essentially it was just a movie. And it had been invented by Thomas Edison, a famous inventor of the late 1800s in the United States. And it occurred, this movie showing occurred for the first time in this building that you're looking at. And this is called the Opera House here in Honolulu, in downtown Honolulu. Opera House is a very exalted sounding name for something which was really just an auditorium. That doesn't mean they put on operas there. It means it was a place where there were stage presentations primarily. And in those days, uh, there were lots of live performances because that's really all you could see up until the invention of movies. So there were not only local performers, but there were a lot of performers traveling through the Hawaiian Islands that were on their way to someplace else. And they would usually stop here and give performances. And this is what was called vaudeville, meaning that these were acts that performed on stage that did things ranging from acrobatics and dancing to singing to acting and there were plays that were put on here etc well all of that stuff is fine but that's not really what we want to talk about we want to talk about movies movies were a new technology at that time and it, they were astonishing to people to see the idea to see a moving picture on a screen was an amazing concept now, still photography was very familiar to everybody by then because still photographs have been taken here in Honolulu for over 50 years by this time in 1897 because the first photographs were taken in 1845, but movies were a different thing. Here's the inside of the Opera House, and this photo is from 1910. So it's a little bit after the time in which the first movies were shown, but this gives you an idea of what did it look like for the audience? What was the experience like? Well, I can't show you those original films, but this is what I can show you to get you give you an idea of what the process occurred was like. There's no movie projector set up in this auditorium because obviously this wasn't a movie theater. This meant that the Veriscope movie projector had to be set up in the audience in, in part, kind of the area where the audience is. And in those days, we expect a movie now, if we go to a movie, we expect it to be at least an hour long. That concept hadn't occurred yet. Movies at this time were something that you watched in between live acts on a stage, usually. So they just took up some time. And there were no long stories. What the people saw in this theater or in this uh, auditorium in 1897 was a series of short films that lasted just a few minutes each. And there was no story. These were just scenes of reality. So it was scenes of uh, uh, fire firefighters uh, fighting a fire, shooting water onto a fire, a bullfight. Uh, the arrival of a train in a train station, the arrival of a ferry at a dock in Chicago. 
these were just everyday scenes, but to see them moving was an amazing concept. And so this was the first time anybody saw a movie in the Hawaiian Islands. And it's, it's laughable to think that how astonishing it was, but it was. Okay. This is a pretty unassuming building in downtown Honolulu. It was located on 4th Street just Makai of King Street. And as you can see, it was the Cook Trust Building. And the Cook Trust Building had opened in 1934. And it was a very attractive modern building for that time period, the early 1930s. And it has uh, designs on the front which are based on tropical plants. So this was not just a generic building. They did try to make it look Hawaiian, but that's not the point. The point is this building, was the site of two technological advances for the Hawaiian Islands. And as you can see, the first was that this was the second building in Hawaii to be fully air conditioned with central air conditioning. And that was in June of 1936. The first building had been of the company that was selling and installing the air conditioning equipment. That was an appliance company called Ramsey and Company. So this was the second one. This was a major thing. We take air conditioning for totally for granted now, but at the time it was an amazing concept to walk into a building which was not only cool, but also uh, didn't have as much humidity in the air. And that's the way air conditioning works. The third building, which came after this was the Hawaii theater, which makes sense because movie theaters could have been quite stuffy and uncomfortable up until the time that air conditioning was invented. Well, not only did they get air conditioning, but because the interior of the building was air conditioned and they didn't wanna have windows open and they didn't wanna have doors open for all of that cooled air to escape out into the outdoors, this was the first building in the Hawaiian Islands to have automatic doors. So that as you walked up to the door, there was a beam of light that was projected across the path that you would walk through. And when you crossed over that, it would give a signal to the, me the mechanical aspect of the door to open it for you. We totally take that for granted. We know that as we walk up to two glass doors or a glass door that has no handle on it, it's just going to open for us. This was the first time that it happened. And that was in 1939. Uh, don't go looking for this building today because it has been gone for a great many years. It was demolished in 1976. And on the site today is the Pioneer Plaza high rise. Now, changing, sub changing subjects and attitudes, etc. Here's something that's just for recreation. This is beer, Primo beer. Primo beer uh, had existed since the late 1800s, but this was another technological advance. This was the first aluminum beer can or beverage can probably in the United States. And it was used for the first time, manufactured and used for the first time right here on the island of Oahu in 1958 for Primo beer. Now there had been beer cans before this, but they were steel, they were not aluminum. And they had never been used here because it would have been too expensive to ship in empty metal cans to just put beer into them. So beer had only been available in bottles. This was a new technology in which aluminum discs, a thick aluminum disc would be put into the special machinery. It would be punched through like a piston in an engine, and then that would form one seamless can. The technology had been used previously in Germany for beer cans, but this was a refinement of it. And this was the first time it was used in the United States. After this, aluminum cans for not only beer, but soft drinks became very common throughout the entire United States. This is the first time this was used. You'll notice that the beer can has a label, a paper label on it. It wasn't possible at that point early on to print on the outside of the can. So they had to put a label on it in order for you to know what it was. And cans like this also 
did not yet have a pop top. You couldn't just press something and open the top of the can. You had to use a metal can opener, the type that you put on and do that. That's how this worked. Now, another technological innovation came to the Hawaiian Islands in 1952. And in December of that year is the first time television broadcasting started in Hawaii. Now, even though many of us no longer look at commercial TV broadcasting as much as we used to in the past, we are still very familiar with the idea of images projected on a glass screen because all of us have an iPhone or a smartphone that does that. All of us are familiar with, you're looking at this right now, either on a computer or you're looking at it on your phone and you're, I, you're accustomed to looking at something that's happening on a glass screen. Well, this is the first time that people here got to see this. Now, television was not brand new in 1952. It had been developed uh, much earlier. And in fact, TV broadcasting had begun outside of the United States on a national basis in the 1930s, both in Britain and in Germany. In the US, it was a little bit longer in taking off, but after World War II ended in 1945, it really exploded. But what you don't know is that when television was really taking off, starting in the late 1940s in the United States, it was stopped for four years by the Federal Communications Commission because they thought that it was growing too fast and they needed to keep track of what was going on. So they stopped issuing licenses for new TV stations in 1948, and they didn't start again until 1952. That left large areas of the United States, including the territory of Hawaii, with no TV stations at all and no opportunity to get any TV stations. Well, when that moratorium ended in 1952, that's when the first time People began not only watching TV, but buying TVs. And here you see a television for sale in an appliance store in Hilo in 1952, in December 1952. You can tell it's December because there are Christmas decorations in this window. And this is the first time that people were able to watch TV here. Here is a photograph of the live broadcast that started television in Hawaii. And this was at the studios of KGMB TV, which was channel nine. And the man in this picture is a, who had, was already a radio announcer who was well known, who used the name Kini Popo. And here he is being kissed and given a lay to start the first television broadcasting. And television broadcasting at that time, not only used national TV network shows, but there was a great deal of local programming. And if you are old enough, you will recall a lot of the local TV programs, which were kids shows, variety shows, talk shows, and things like that, all of which were very important in their time, but unfortunately, none of which still, still exist pretty much because most of them were live. They were never recorded. So if you wanted to go back and see 1950s local television or 1960s or even 70s local television, you're not going to be able to do that because nobody ever recorded them. So it's a large segment of our history, unfortunately, that's been lost. All right, something you've never given a thought to, but it's part of history. Parking meters. Okay. Parking meters were invented in the 1930s and they were first installed in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. You would think logically that parking meters exist simply for local governments to make money by charging people to leave their car in a space. And you'd be wrong because that is not why parking meters were invented and not why they were installed. Parking meters instead exist to make people move their cars and not leave them in the same parking space all day, meaning that other people can't park. And the reason parking meters were first installed at the Honolulu airport in 1951, and I'm gonna consult my notes here, it was in August of 1951, 
was so that people who worked at the airport didn't take up all the good parking spaces so that others coming to the airport didn't have a place to park. So this is the first time this got done in the Hawaiian Islands. And <laughs> you got 12 minutes for one cent or you got a full hour for five cents. And these parking meters only took pennies and nickels. That's how much it cost at the time. And here is what it looked like. This is the original Honolulu airport that was built in the 1940s. And this is what was used by everybody up until 1962 when the current airport opened. But in both of these photographs, you can see, if you look carefully, the parking meters on poles installed in front of this wooden building. And as soon as the parking meters went into effect, everybody who had been parking and taking up the good spaces who worked there immediately moved to park across the street on Lagoon Drive because this was in a different place than the current airport. And that meant that, in fact, spaces were now available for people coming and going out of the airport. So the parking meters worked and did their job. In 1952, February 1st, 1952, parking meters were installed in downtown Honolulu for the first time. And here are some of those early meters in 1952 in front of the parking lot that's used for people going to the post office in uh, downtown Honolulu. And in the background is the Hawaiian Electric Building. There had been a lot of discussion about installing parking meters in Honolulu, even as early as the 1930s when they were first invented. But there had been a great deal of resistance to them. Uh, people thought that they would cause parking to be more difficult. And parking downtown was already a big subject because there weren't enough spaces for people to go downtown and shop, go to doctor's offices, go to businesses, etc. Well. It finally, all of that discussion ended and they were installed and they did what they were supposed to do. And then the following year in 1953, parking meters spread to Waikiki. And here are parking meters along Kalakaua Avenue as they appeared in 1958. And this meant that parking meters were stuck here forever and they were not gonna go away. And again, they are there to not make money but for making all of us not leave our car in the same place for the entire day and not open up a space for somebody else. I might also add that parking meters spread to Hilo in 1952. So it wasn't just an Oahu thing. It wasn't just a Honolulu thing. They were here and they were here forever. This is something that some people who are watching this program may remember, but many of you won't. And this is the La Ronde Rotating Restaurant. This was the first rotating restaurant in the United States. And there had been two others before this in other countries. And these were a thing in the 50s, 60s, into the 1970s. You built a rotating restaurant on the top of a high-rise building, and people could go and sit in that, have cocktails, have a meal, and look at the view because the whole thing rotated. So you sat at your table and the floor moved and what you saw was an entire 360 view, panoramic view of the city. Well, this was a big deal. This was a well-publicized thing. And some of you may remember that uh, in 1962, there was a World's Fair in the city of Seattle and they installed a very popular and well-known rotating restaurant, which is called the Space Needle. Well, the Space Needle is still functioning, but La Ronde Restaurant is not. And this is a photograph taken just a few weeks ago. The Ala Moana building is still there. The Round Restaurant is still there on the top, as you can see, but it hasn't functioned as a restaurant for many years, and it has not rotated for many years. And the reason it stopped rotating was because the mechanical uh, equipment that made it rotate broke down. It was a unique system developed just for this building and it wasn't possible to fix it anymore, nor was there an economic reason to keep it going. And one of the things that's made this not viable as a restaurant is because 
There are so many high rises around it now that you don't get a view anymore. When it opened in 1961, you saw a clear vista all the way to Diamond Head. You saw all the way towards Eva. You don't see that anymore because so many buildings of this height or much taller have blocked that view. So next time you are driving past Ala Moana, go to Ala Moana, look up at this building and you'll see the La Ronde rotating restaurant up on top, but it isn't a restaurant anymore and it doesn't rotate. Here's a fact sheet that uh, was given out at the time of Laurent's opening. And I'm just gonna read some of it to you. It, uh, it moved at three and two thirds feet per minute, creating one revolution per hour. Meaning if you had a meal that took one hour, you got a 360 degree view. Um, the diameter was 72 feet. Um, it could hold 250 persons. And I was one of those people a number of times. I had, had meals at La Ronde and enjoyed them a lot. First rot revolving restaurant in America on top of what was then the tallest building in the Hawaiian Islands at 25 stories. And it was part of what was called the largest shopping center in the world, meaning Ala Moana Center. And at the time it was really exceptional for a shopping center to have a 25 story building attached to it. And I don't just mean here, I mean in the United States, anywhere in the world, that was a big deal. Largest shopping center in the world, right here in Honolulu. Well, here's a picture of what Ala Moana looked like when it opened in 1959. And at the time it was advertised as the largest in the world. This is what was called phase one. This is the first part of Ala Moana, and it was anchored by the Sears store that you see right in the foreground. This was only about half of what Ala Moana was going to become because phase one, as I said, as you can tell, is just the first part. And in 1965, they opened phase two, which is the part on the Diamond Head end, which originally was anchored by Liberty House, which is now Macy's. So in this aerial picture, you can see not only Ala Moana phase one and phase two, you can see the Ala Moana building with La Ronde on the right. Now, since this picture was taken in 1970, 71, Ala Moana has grown a great deal. Uh, they've added a lot to it, and I'm not even gonna try to get into all of the description of what that is. But today, Ala Moana is still one of the largest in the world. It is the largest open air shopping center in the world, meaning not enclosed, not air conditioned, has more than 350 businesses in it. And uh, it is the eighth largest shopping center in the country, if not the world, I think it's the country. It's also extremely successful. It produces a huge amount of revenue every year. And this is exceptional because many shopping centers and shopping malls have been gradually dwindling, closing and being demolished. So from their peak in the 1970s, many are no longer in existence, but Ala Moana still is. And partly that's because it's right in the middle of a densely populated and urbanized city so it's not often a suburban area. It's right where a lot of people live. So that helps to keep it going, not to mention uh, millions of tourists go there every year as well. Finally, we're gonna end with something that's actually quite important economically. And that is the start of containerized shipping. This is a complicated story. People for hundreds of years have been trying to invent a way to create standardized containers to put things in, to ship them, to move them, to transport them. Because if you are trying to move hundreds of small individual objects, it's like with us, you wanna put things in a box, you wanna put things in a bin, you don't wanna carry them all individually. There have been many, many attempts throughout the world to try to create standardized shipping containers. But the one that finally really took hold took place in 1956. And the head of a trucking company in the United States bought, um, was trying to develop standardized shipping containers. 
the company then bought a shipping line and the man oversaw the development of the containers. And the first such shipment took place in 1956 between Newark, New Jersey and Texas. And it was a success. The first containerized shipping in the Pacific Ocean outside of that original inventor's company was by the Matson Navigation Company between California and Honolulu. And this is the arrival of that first container ship in 1958. And you can see there are the containers right plainly in front of you on the ship. And the beauty of this whole process is once you start using standardized containers, it makes everything way easier. It's also much safer for all of the stuff because it's now not being loaded and unloaded individually where it can fall on the dock or it can get rained on or it can get stolen. It's locked in a container. The container gets taken off the ship, it gets lowered onto a truck, and it gets driven away. And that's what you see going on here. This was a huge technological step forward. And while it didn't originate here, it was first used in the Pacific right here. And finally, this photograph, uh, it's difficult to see, but I find it intriguing. And I like to show it to people because as you can see, each one of these containers, or maybe it's not obvious, but in this photograph, each of these containers has an individual serial number on it. And the one right in the center of this picture is number 10001. I'm saying that's probably the very first shipping container in existence that was brought in brought to the Hawaiian Islands and it's number one. Okay, shipping containers absolutely revolutionized shipping all over the world. And it meant that not only did it happen a lot more economically and efficiently, but it also meant that cities changed a great deal because the existing dock facilities became outmoded very quickly. And that meant that they had to build new container shipping docking areas someplace else. And what that meant then in turn was that cities like San Francisco and New York that had docks all along their waterfront, all of those docks went out of use and they either gradually fell apart uh, and literally just stood there until they collapsed. But what's happened is in many cases, those dock areas, those waterfronts of uh, cities have been redeveloped. So that's happened all over the world. Cities have changed a great deal because all the docks were gone and then they got developed into other stuff. So just this one technology made changes throughout the whole world. And it happened here in Honolulu too, because even though our docks do exist as they did before, most of our containerized shipping is what's going on. And that's happening on Sand Island in Honolulu Harbor, totally separate from all of the downtown docks, which are still existing, but are not used as much. So there you have it, folks. Factoids from Hawaiian history. Thank you for watching. I am DeSoto Brown. You've been watching How Did We Get Here, here on Think Tech Hawaii. I hope to see you again soon. And uh, until then, aloha.